Lord be with you. Would you turn with me, if you haven't already, to the book of Habakkuk? We're going to continue working through our series, looking at the minor prophets. And if you will recall, as we've been working through this series, we've um, gone through seven thus far. We've seen in the book of Hosea, we see God's redeeming love for his people. Though we have all committed spiritual adultery, we see Hosea shows that God loves us anyway and seeks to redeem us. We see in the book of Joel a reminder that God will one day judge all of the nations for their sins, and we see this in the, the day of the Lord. In the book of Amos, we see God, how he hates and abhors injustice, and he calls the justified to pursue justice. In the book of Obadiah, we see through the Edomites how there is the peril of pride, how pride leads to a fall, and we are called to walk humbly with our God. In the book of Jonah, we're reminded of God's character and how he has compassion for the nations, how we also are to have a compassion for the nations, and we are to choose compassion over our own personal comfort. And then in the book of Micah, we see how we are to do justly, we are to love mercy, and we are to walk humbly with our God. And then finally, last week, what we did is we saw in the book of Nahum how though there was this judgment of doom coming to the Ninevites, we see that within this message of judgment, we also find comfort in the Lord, that God can actually give us comfort in the chaos that we find in him as our, as our strong tower, as our fortress. Well, today what we're going to be doing is looking at the book of Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk takes place in a unique place in history from the fact that it's the final days or the final decades of the southern kingdom of Judah. So if you will recall before, we talked about how after Solomon died, there was this schism between the northern kingdom of Israel, sometimes referred to as, as Ephraim, right, or Samaria, and then we have the southern kingdom that is notably referred to as Judah. Well, we've seen that through a lot of these judgments and these prophecies, how there's been punishments and there's been judgments done to both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Well, at this point now, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been completely destroyed and taken over by the Assyrians, right? That would have been like the group of Nineveh, right? That's what Nineveh was being judged for in the previous book of Nahum, right? Nahum was judging Nineveh because they had been so wicked and they had taken over the northern kingdom already, right? Well, now we're looking at the southern kingdom and now they've been, um, you know, living and moving along without the northern kingdom for a period of time, but they've continued in their own violence, their own wickedness and justice. And so what we find then is Habakkuk looking at this kingdom, fearful of what is going to happen to them because he already knows what happened to the northern kingdom. And so what he does in this book is he sees and he's looking at all of the evil and he's looking at all of the suffering that's going on. And he basically starts to, to pray to God and ask God, why? He wants to know, where are you, God, in the midst of my suffering, and why are you allowing evil to flourish in our land? And so it's interesting, what's unique about this book is that it's unlike all the others where typically you see a prophet addressing God's people on God's behalf, right? He's usually telling the nation, hey, you're doing this wrong, God's going to judge you. Well, this is actually the flip side. In this book, what we find is it's actually a conversation with God. So what Habakkuk does is he's actually talking to God in this book on the behalf of his people. So it's flipped. Rather than talking to God's people on God's behalf, it's flipped, and he's talking to God himself. So we see a conversation with God here on the subject of evil and suffering in the world. And maybe that's a question that you've maybe had for God at some point, why God allows evil, why he allows suffering in this world. And so what happens in the very beginning of the book, it starts out with um, it describing it as a burden, which the prophet Habakkuk saw. So he's receiving a burden. He's feeling this weight as he's looking at the nation and the land of Judah and how we see all of this, this evil and the suffering. And so he does, at the very beginning, he cries out to the Lord and basically asks him, where are you? Why are you silent? How long will this go on? And what's so beautiful in this book is we see in verse 5 that God responds. Sometimes God doesn't respond to us, right? He doesn't always tell us with an audible voice, right, or through a prophet exactly why or give us an answer to our questions, right, as we're praying to him in the night. Well, here we see that God actually gives him an answer about the, the evil and the suffering that's going on. But what he tells them is something that not exactly what Habakkuk was either expecting or maybe desiring. So what he tells him is, I see the evil. 
I see the suffering in Judah, and guess what? I'm going to take care of it. I'm actually going to judge it. But it's not the way that he had maybe hoped where there was going to be a revival in Judah, right? And we're going to see a lot of people come back to favor in the sight of the Lord, and and they're going to honor God with their worship. Instead, he says, I'm going to destroy Judah, and I'm going to destroy them with, if you look at verse 6, it says the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans, that would have been a term that would have been synonymous with the Babylonians. So if you know about the Babylonian exile, right, where they're in Babylon, that's who's coming to destroy them. He says, I'm going to send Babylon to come and destroy Judah. So now if you can imagine Habakkuk, who's so upset and, and, he's, and he's crying out for God to do something for his people and his nation, and he says, I am going to do something. I'm going to destroy them, and I'm going to destroy them with your enemy, the Babylons. Well, what Habakkuk responds then is, he says, well, wait, no, that's even worse. He's like, that doesn't answer my, my prayer request. I wanted you to, to save us. And instead you're saying that you're going to destroy us with someone that's even worse, even more wicked than us. And so he starts to describe how wicked the Babel, uh, Babylonians are. Well, he, he, that, in chapter 1 we see it kind of ends with him asking this question to God. And then basically in the beginning of chapter 2 what he does is he says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. So what he basically does is, okay, I heard your response. I'm really, really not, I'm struggling with this. I don't understand it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand my watch. I'm going to be like a watchman. And I'm going to stand here. I'm going to wait for your reply. And then I'm going to see what you say and see how I'm corrected. So he even has an expectation or an anticipation that he's wrong in what he's thinking or why he's feeling this way. And he wants God to give him some more clarity on the matter. So then in chapter 2, what we see then is that now God responds again. And he actually tells him to get some tablets and to write this down. He wants other generations to know what he says here to Habakkuk. And so what he does is he reminds him that he is good, that he's just. And in fact, what he's going to do is he's not going to let Babylon succeed for long. In fact, he will also judge the Babylonians. And in fact, we see in chapter 2 how God gives these five woe statements and how he's basically describing how sinful and how wicked the Babylonians are and how he sees every single act that they are committing. And he is going to judge them for it. So he says, don't think that evil and suffering is going to be forever. In fact, there's going to be a future day where God will eliminate all evil, all suffering and so what he does in chapter 2, and uh, it was a part of the verses that, w- that were read this morning, he calls the prophet to live by faith. And he says, the just shall live by faith at the end of verse 4 of chapter 2. And so that's what he calls him to. And then in chapter 3, what we see then is the prophet gives um, a prayer, or really it almost looks like what, it, what you would see in commonly in the Psalms. He gives this psalm of praise to God because he, he gets a vision of God and his glory and his power, and he's reminded of all the things that God has done for Israel in the past, and also looking forward to all the things that God is going to do for his people in the future. And so it, it results and ends with him just praising God for how good he is, and he's going to find joy even in these circumstances where he sees the the destruction of his people and his land, and he just praises him, and he says that I find my strength in the Lord. I find my strength in God's sovereignty. So that's what we see in this short book of Habakkuk. So let's just kind of just take some applications from the book. The first thing that I just want to draw your attention to is I think that in this book we are reminded that God sympathizes with our suffering. God sympathizes with our suffering. See, in in chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, we see basically the problem in the book, the question in the book, right? Habakkuk cries out to God, and he's asking, why evil and why suffering, and why does it have to be your people, Judah? So in in uh, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, it says, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, Perverse judgment proceeds. 
So we see here him explaining his heart here. He's, he's frustrated with what he's um, experiencing and encountering in his own land, and he's asking God where he is, and he's wanting to know why he seems so silent in the fact that he's literally saying, this is violence, this is wickedness, there's suffering, injustice, even your law is being neglected. They don't even care about what your word says. And he's bringing all of this to God, and he wants to know why God isn't answering or listening to him. And I think that we, what we see in this is that this is a common theme that I think goes throughout the Bible. In times of trouble, we see that it is easy to question God, right? It, it's really not that hard. To, you don't really feel tempted to question God when everything's going right, right? Because you, you're like, yeah, God, you should be doing it like this. This is exactly how my life should be going. But as soon as we hit those, those storms, right, we, we hit those times of trouble, times of suffering, we, we witness and encounter evil, and then those are the moments that we start to question God. And like I said, this isn't uncommon in Scripture. In fact, we see this happening over and over again in the Psalms, right? In Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2, listen to how similar it is to what Habakkuk said. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? That is King David who is writing that there. So we see King David, right? One of the greatest kings of Israel's history. And then we come to Habakkuk where Judah is about to be destroyed. And we see a very similar prayer. And I think that this is something that many of us probably have asked ourselves or we have prayed this. Why, God? Why does this have to happen? Why do I have to be suffering with this issue? Why am I sick? Why am I in pain? Why did I lose my job? Why is the car not running again? Why is my family or my relationships or my, my spouse, why are these things all happening? Why am I being plagued with this burden? We all come to God and we ask God these questions, and I think that it's, it's, it's part of the human condition. And in fact, I would say that this is the question that most non-believers will bring against the faith. You've probably heard of the problem of evil before. This is a, a, a ph philosophical question that they will ask, and they'll say, if God is all-powerful, and if he is perfectly loving, then why does evil and suffering exist, right? Because if he's all-powerful, then he can stop it, right? And if he's perfectly loving, you would think he would want to get rid of it all, right? So either he's not all-powerful, he just can't do it, or he's not perfectly loving because otherwise, if he loved us, he would take care of these issues, right? So that's typically the question that comes up. So why, God? So you know, you're not all powerful. You're not all good. It must be one of these two things. So you're seeing a challenge to God's sovereignty and to his, his character. That's really the question here. But I think if we start to really address and think about this more deeply, as we look to the book of Habakkuk, we'll see that this really doesn't... Um, solve the problem. I don't really think that this is going to do much to um, eliminate our faith in the Lord. I think that we could actually think about this clearly and see that God has morally sufficient reasons to allow certain things to occur. Could God allow certain things to happen for a greater good? In fact, maybe you've gone to the dentist before, right? And some people don't like the dentist. Maybe you go there you find yourself, I've had a lot of dent dental work and it's not fun, right? But you go through that suffering, why? For a potential good, right? A greater good, right? Where you'll have healthier teeth, right? Or a, a greater smile, right? Well, we see that we will go through temporary suffering at time for a greater good. So I think that we can see that there can be morally sufficient reasons to allow certain things to occur. So what might be God's reasons to allow this suffering and evil to exist in our world? Well, I think that we see that God allows evil to exist because it is a necessary consequence of granting humans free will. See, if we look back to the garden, right, we see that it says that God has created everything good, right? Everything was good. There was nothing evil, right? Everything was good, and God created it, and he was rejoicing in his creation. And we see that at the, the climax right, of his creation, we, he creates man in his own image. But we also see that he creates these two different trees, right? He gives them the tree that he, they, they can eat from, which is eternal life, right? And then they also have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And he tells them not to eat from that tree. He doesn't want them to partake of that tree. And we see that they chose to rebel against God. God gave them that free choice, and then they chose sin. And when they chose sin, God said the consequence of your sin would be that you shall surely die. So what we're seeing here is that God gave man, at the very beginning, a choice to either serve and honor and worship him, or to rebel against him and to take life into their own hands. And so why would God maybe give us free will? Like, Couldn't God have just not given us that option and maybe we wouldn't have suffered? Well, sure, God could have done that, right? He's created other animals. He's created plants. He could have created robots. He could have created a lot of different things, right? But he created us and gave us volition. He gave us choice. And the reason I think he gave us a choice is so that we could have a greater good. And now what is that greater good? I think it is love. To have a true loving relationship, you must have the ability to choose. If you were to say, you're going to marry me whether you like it or not, right? You're going to love me whether you like it or not. We'll see that that's not true love. You have to be able to say, I, I, I could not love you, but I'm going to love you. I have the choice to not honor you, but I'm going to honor you. And so what I think here is what God allows in, in the, the allowance of suffering and evil to exist, it's because he wants us to choose to love and be in a, a relationship with him. So he has to allow the potential for evil and suffering to exist so that we can have true love. So I think that's the greater good that is an option on the table because of God's willing to allow these things to occur in our lives. But sometimes we hear that, right? We hear that, okay, there might be a philosophical or a theological explanation for why suffering or why evil, right? Because God wants to give us free will so that we can maybe be in a loving relationship or we can love one another, right? So maybe, okay, that makes sense, you know, logically speaking, but that doesn't really speak to my heart issue, why I'm still really struggling, right? Maybe you're thinking, I'm still really hurting right now, and I don't care about this distant theological explanation. Well, I think though sometimes we feel like no one else cares or understands what we are going through, and maybe that's you. Maybe you don't feel like anyone else understands, no one else cares. I think what we see in Scripture is that God does. God does understand what you're going through. He knows exactly what you're going through, and he does care. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, I'm sure many of us know this passage, it says that we are to cast all our cares upon him, for he, what? Cares for you. So, so many of us, we, we know this verse, but do we really believe it? You can give God your cares, your, your worries, your burdens, your suffering. You can give it to him. He's actually calling you, inviting you. He says, do it. Give it to me because I care for you. God says, I care for you and I care about what you're going through. In fact, I think that we are shown through scripture that God cares more about our suffering than we do. See, some people will say, yeah, I believe God cares about me. I believe God loves me, but I don't really believe that he cares more than I do about my situation. God does. See, God loves righteousness more than you do. God hates wickedness more than you do. And so if you are going through suffering, wickedness, death, sickness, financial struggle, he sees all of this going on and he hates it. So if you're ever crying about something, I want you to understand God cares more about you and your circumstances. I think that's a beautiful thing. In fact, in Psalm 56, 8, it says, you, that is the Lord, keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. And that verse really stuck out to me this uh, past week in our small group. We, we were addressing actually this topic and we're looking at this verse. And what's so cool about this is that there was a, a tradition that had gone on through um, the ancient world where sometimes when husbands or, or men of war would go to battle, and then the, the wives or the women that were left behind as they were waiting for them to come back, they would have what is called a tear bottle. 
And every single time that they would think about their loved one that was gone to war, and they would cry, they would literally put the bottle up to their, their face, and they would allow their tears to go into the bottle. And so that way, when their loved one would come back, they would show them how much they meant to them. They would say, I cried for you this often, right? And they would show it to them. And, and, and I was saying this, I said, wow, I cannot imagine what that would be like emotionally. If I would come home and my wife would have this, see, my wife probably wouldn't cry for me that much. <laughs> She'd be like rejoicing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but could you just imagine, though, tears of joy, maybe. Um, would you imagine, though, if you got, came home and it was a rough time and, and you come home and you see, I've been weeping for you and I've collected this and I remember every single tear. Well, God is saying that I've seen every single one of your tears. I've seen everything you've gone through. He says, I've kept track of every single sorrow and I've even recorded it in my book. So he says, I've, I've tracked it, I've collected it in my bottle, and I'm writing it down in my book. And he says, I have it all. I remember it all. I'm there with you in the suffering. I care so much about you. I care so much about your circumstances. And I was thinking about this the other day. Some of you know my, my son Liam. He had an accident a while back, about a year ago now, where we had to, to rush to St. Louis and... Um, and we had to go to the hospital there at Children's, and, you know, we were so concerned about uh, what was going on with him and uh, with the accident and everything, and it, it's interesting, you know, me and my wife, we were thinking about it and talking about it the other day, but, you know, he doesn't remember it. He probably will never even be able to recall this event other than from what we tell him, but, you know, what's so funny. There are so many things like that in our own lives where we were crying. We were severely injured, suffering throughout our, our periods of life, our seasons in our lives. And now we have forgotten many of those things, haven't we? But I think what we're finding here is that God hasn't forgotten those. Even those moments that we have been brought through, that God has redeemed, he still remembers them in detail. That is one of those tears in the jar that he's collected. He is remembering all of these things. And so I think it really should encourage us to think, God truly cares. God really can sympathize with our suffering. In fact, we see that God can relate to our weaknesses, our temptations, our struggles, because he himself experienced them when he was on the earth. We know that God came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 4.15, listen to what it says. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Think about this. Jesus is reminding us that when he came to the earth, he really saw what was going on. He really felt the weight of temptation. He saw what was happening with sin. He saw wickedness. He saw the suffering. He would weep and have um, compassion. He would mourn over the different things going on. Now we know that he was perfect, but it says that he experienced it. We know that he was the suffering servant. He suffered on our behalf. So what we actually see is that we don't have a God who is distant, far away, doesn't care, unemotional. We see a God who has so much compassion that he came to the earth and suffered and died for us. He suffered for us and he suffers with us. That is who our God is. Our God is a suffering God. But more than that, we also see in chapter 1 verse 5 that God doesn't just see our suffering. Does he care about our suffering? He hears our cries but he is also emphatically at work. In chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. He's saying, I am actively at work. You're not going to believe exactly what I'm doing or, or how I'm going to accomplish it, but I am going to make a work in your days, a work in your life. And he's saying this to the prophet, but he also is showing this to the church. In fact, we know in Romans 8, 28, another well-quoted passage, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God 
and to those who are called according to his purpose. So what we're told is God is working. He's actively working. Someone who is sympathetic of your suffering hates evil, hates wickedness, and he's going to show us that one day he will put an end to it all. That's our God. We're seeing that God, he, he's there. He'll answer. He, he's available in our times of questioning. We see that he gives us morally sufficient reasons for why he allows it so that we can actually have true love, one of the greatest goods there could possibly be. We see that he cares more about suffering than we do, that he actually came and suffered for us and he suffers now with us, and he's actively working to combat and end all evil and suffering. So I think we can clearly see then that God does sympathize. He does care. He's not absent in our times of suffering. The next thing that I think we see is that the just are to live by faith. See, we hear this revelation. We see the scripture reminding us of these truths about God's sympathy and his compassion for us. But we're also called to live it out by faith. We have to trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God. In chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, I'm going to read this again. It says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. What God is saying here, because this is God speaking to Habakkuk, he's saying that he has a plan that's going to happen. He's, he has a work that is in motion. He's going to bring good out of this circumstance, but what he says is, I want you to trust me, and I want all of those who are just, all of the righteous people who trust and look to God, I want you to trust in me, trust my plan, and recognize that my timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. Perfect. We discussed in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 3 how everything is beautiful in its time. The reason we can find beauty in our seasons, in the moments of time, is because God is providentially over it all. God is sovereign over our seasons. God is sovereign over our suffering. And so what he's saying here is he says, wait for it. Wait and he says, and though it may tarry, which really what that means is, though it may seem like it's taking a long time, that it's tarrying, he says, it will not tarry. That's what he says in verse 3. He's saying it will not tarry because he knows God's timing is always perfect. God is never going to be early for you, but he's also never going to be late for you either. Whatever God does, whenever he does it, we know that it is the perfect and right time. So he says we, we are to trust in his goodness because we know his timing is perfect, but we also know that God's plans are always good and just. So not only is his timing going to be right, but what he's going to do in the time is always going to be good and just. In fact, in Psalm 119, 68, it says this, You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. It's a really simple, small verse you can memorize. You are good, that is God, you are good in your very nature, who you are in your character. You're good, you're faithful, righteous, holy. And then you do good. Everything that you do is always good. Think about that. Everything that happens in Scripture, everything that happens in our lives is all under God's sovereign will and plan. And now we know that God then, as he's working, he is bringing good out of all of this. He has a purpose. And so that's why the psalmist, what he says is, teach me your statutes. What that really means is, let me understand your will. I want to understand your word and your works. I want to just be in relationship with you. I want to submit to your plan, your will for my life. And then he knows, because I know that if I do that, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So we see there's this, there's this constant reminder for us to trust in the goodness of God. The just will live by faith. But just because we are trusting in God or just because we have faith in his goodness, that doesn't mean that we're always going to understand it or like it in the immediate context, right? What we're going to find and what we see in this book is that God's ways are higher than our ways. Are you okay with letting God be God? God's ways are higher 
than our ways because Habakkuk, he could not fully comprehend God's plan. First off, he didn't like it in the first place that there was evil and suffering in the world. But then when he found out God's answer to the suffering, that it was going to be by the Babylonians, he says, that seems even worse. I don't understand this. And in chapter, uh, in chapter 1, verse 5, it even says, you won't understand it. We can't fully fathom what God is doing with all of the different people groups, nations, politics, suffering, you know, sickness, all of these things that happen in our world, we don't see how they all come together. But God sees the entire picture. He knows exactly what he is doing. And he's saying, trust me, even if you don't fully understand, because God doesn't owe us an explanation. Once again, God is God. Are you willing to trust, have faith in God, even when you don't understand? Because I think that's what we are reminded in Scripture. Proverbs 3, 5, what does it say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It doesn't say trust in the Lord except for when it seems like you don't understand it anymore. Right? You are to trust even in the moments where it doesn't make sense. There will be times where you are suffering and it does not make sense. But can you cultivate a childlike faith like Jesus calls us to? Where you just look to your parent, you know, whenever you were a young one, and you saw that I didn't understand everything, I didn't know how all life worked, but I knew that my parents were there, and they were going to take care of it for me. That's what he wants, like, us to be for him. God, I don't understand it, I don't see the whole picture, I don't know how it all works out, but I know that you're good, I know that you're going to do good, and I'm just trusting in your plan, in your power, in your faithfulness. I'm just, I'm just going to trust you like a child would trust their father or mother. Because I've said this before, and I think it's helpful. Trust isn't trust if you can't trust when you need to trust. I want to say that again. (laughs) Trust isn't trust if you can't trust when you need to trust. Now, let me just explain what that means then. So there are going to be times in your life where it's going to be hard to trust, right? Where you don't feel like trusting in God. Because you start to doubt his goodness or you start to doubt his sovereignty, his power, right? But in those moments, if you can't trust God, then you have to ask yourself, have I really ever trusted him? Because that is the moment that your faith is actually tested. You don't have faith if everything's going perfect. If life goes easy all the time for you, how many people have you praised for their faith and said, wow, I am so just encouraged by your, your, your trust and your faith in the Lord because your life has been perfect and easy and nothing bad has ever happened. And you just seem to continue to trust God. Who would be amazed by that? No one. But you know someone who would be amazing? If everything happened horrible to them like the book of Job. And then Job says, I will still trust the Lord. I will still praise God. I will be like Noah, and I will continue to build the ark, even when it doesn't make sense. I'm going to trust God no matter what. No matter what God throws at me, whatever life throws at me, I will trust him, whether he gives me all of the blessings in the world or if he takes all of the blessings away, I will trust the Lord. Because the Christian life, from beginning to end, is based upon faith. In fact, if you know in the book of Romans, he quotes this verse of, of chapter 2, verse 4 of Habakkuk. In Romans 1.17, he says this. He says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What that is saying is that if if you're a Christian, your entire life is going to be summarized by those two things, faith and faith. Everything you do is to trust God. Every single day, you trust God, you believe in his goodness, believe in his plan, and what we see in the book of Romans, what Paul is actually bringing that out of, he's saying, and that's actually how we have eternal life. He says the just or the righteous live by faith. He says, you are declared righteous righteous by God when you place your faith in what Christ did on the cross. See, that's the point he's making. He says, you can't save yourself. You can't commit good works. You can't earn your salvation. You can't make yourself righteous by trying to obey all of God's commandments because you're going to ultimately fall short of God's glory. But he says, but if you trust, if you place your faith, then you will be just. 
You will be declared righteous. You'll be in a right relationship with God again. So not only is he saying that we should live by faith in, in just a general sense and that that's the good thing to do, but he also says the way that you actually truly will live, live forever, that you'll be just is by your faith in what Christ did for us. So we have to see faith is a key component of our lives. In fact, we see that the way that we overcome this world is by our faith in Christ. So we must live by faith, even when we don't understand, even when it doesn't make sense, even when suffering is completely terrible, extreme, can't imagine what you're going through. Those are the moments that we need to trust in the Lord. And then the final thing that I want to draw from the text today is that I think that we see that strength can actually be found in our suffering. There are many verses that you can find on this, but we see that suffering can actually be sanctifying. That is, suffering can actually spiritually strengthen us. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, God gives us trials. He allows us to suffer sometimes. And what we see is that once again, he can bring a greater good out of it. And what he says is, I will actually strengthen you through your suffering. He says, I will allow you to grow in your faith, that it will test your faith and it will produce patience. And then this patience will have a perfect work that will make you perfect and complete. Do you want to be a perfect and complete Christian? Then you have to experience trials in your life. That is how God completes us. Once again, Christ, our example, suffered greater than any other person. If he is our example and if he's the one we want to follow, why would we expect anything less? Christ suffered and he was the perfect human, so we likewise need to see that our faith will endure and will make us more mature in Christ as we experience these hardships. And in fact, that's exactly what Habakkuk does in this book. If you notice, at the very beginning of chapter 1, he begins with this prayerful plea, right? He's, he's, he's petitioning and begging God to do something, right? Well, as he goes through the book, he actually starts to learn to apply that message, the judge shall live by faith in his own life. See, that's what I love about this book is he actually is hearing the, the message and he's actually learning to apply it to himself. So he moves from a prayerful plea in chapter 1 to a psalm of praise at the end in chapter 3. And I want to read this, 17 to 19 of chapter 3. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills." What he is saying here is basically if my life and all of my circumstances completely just get horrible, right? He's like basically if, if, if the Babylonians come and destroy the land, there's no more food, there's no more drink, there's no more cattle, there's no more people, there's no place to hide or my, my head at night, that I'm still going to trust and rejoice in you. And he says, the only reason he says that he can do this is because he sees God for who he is in his glory. He sees that God is on the throne no matter what circumstances may look like. And he says, I will find my strength in you, in the sovereign God, I will trust in you. And, and he describes himself as not only having strength, but he also says sure-footedness, like a deer, to have speed like a deer. See, you know, if you look at a deer before, whenever they're going, they're pretty good at keeping their footing, especially like as they're going up high hills or mountains, right? And he says that that's what I'm like. He starts really, really low and depressed at the beginning of the book. But he says, but when I find my strength in God, even through suffering, I'm able to go to the highest hills. I can go to the highest mountaintops just like a deer, 
See the difference between where he starts and where he finishes? Because when he places his faith in God, he finds the strength, even in the suffering. And in fact, that's exactly what Jesus teaches here in Matthew 17, 20 about our faith. It says this, For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. What he's saying is if you have your faith in me, if you trust in the Lord and his power, you will be able to do amazing things. Nothing will be impossible. You'll be able to go against these mountainous obstacles in your life, and you'll be able to be like the deer and overcome them. You'll be able to go on top of these high hills, on top of the mountains. You can move the mountains because you have faith and strength in the Lord. But once again, it all comes back to your own perspective, the choice that you make. Because here's the thing, we're all going to suffer, right? And we know that there are times where people suffer and they fall apart. They don't get better. They get depressed and and it can get even worse than that. But we also know that there are examples of people who go through extreme suffering and they become even more strong or stronger than they could possibly have ever imagined that they ever would be. And I, I want to leave with you the, with this example, and many of you have, may have heard something along this line, but during the Holocaust, there were these concentration camps. And at the concentration camps, there would be many that would be going in that were believers or that, that claimed they had faith in God. And you had others who were atheists or agnostic or they didn't really have a religion, right? You know what's so interesting? There were some individuals that professed faith in Christ or or faith in God, and by the end of it, they gave up. They said, God can't exist. God can't be good because of the suffering. But you know, there are also those who didn't believe in God, and then at the end of it, they found their joy and their strength in God through the suffering. Do you realize the circumstances are the same for both individuals? The difference is, are you leaning on God in the suffering? Or are you moving away from God? Are you blaming God, questioning God in a sinful manner? Or are you trusting in him? Because you can be that person that gives up, or you can be that person that says, God, I trust in you, and I will go to the hills because I know you are my strength, not my circumstances. You're the one on the throne. So I think that's what we see in this conversation with God that, that Habakkuk gives us about suffering and evil. We see God sympathizes with our suffering. We see that the just shall live by faith and that ultimately strength can be found in our suffering when we seek him as our strength. Let us pray. Father, we come to you and we are grateful for your word. And through this series, Lord, that we see these reminders to trust you, to live by faith that we wouldn't be burdened by looking at our circumstances, but we would ultimately look to you, the one on the throne, who has all authority, all power, is perfectly good and loving, and has a plan that you are working for the good of those who love you. And that we see through your son the sympathy and compassion that you not only did you suffer for us, but you suffer with us every single day. So Lord, I pray that we would trust in you, live by faith, rejoice in the gospel that because of our faith in you, we have now been declared righteous, we have eternal life, and that we will be strengthened in this reality even through seasons of suffering. We love you. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.